everybody. Uh, if you were planning on joining us in about 20 minutes, we're a little early, but this is going to be recorded so you can watch it anytime. And if you jump right in the middle, um, you will be able to watch it as many times as you like. Uh, just a little bit of um, housekeeping. You can find us also on the YouTube under Jill Carnahan channel. Um, please subscribe there and watch all the videos. We've got lots of mold experts. And today is um, going to be one of my favorites uh, with Dr. Sandy uh, Gupta. And I will introduce him in just a moment. Um, please leave your questions in the feed and I'll try to follow those. So if we get any live questions, we can actually jump right in and answer those questions here on the podcast today. Um, and again, I think you know um, my background in mold. This is gonna be a really exciting and fun discussion as we dive deep. I want to introduce my guest in case you don't know him. Um, Dr. Sandeep Gupta is a board certified general practitioner practicing in Australia's Sunshine Coast. I was actually supposed to go there this spring. <laughs> and of course, with uh, the pandemic, I was not able to make it. So I hope maybe next year I'll be able to be back. And uh, I think was the conference that I was looking at attending close to where you're at? Yeah, it was just an hour away, Metagenics Congress in, in Cancer, I think it was. Excellent. So hopefully next year or soon I'll be able to go. I've never been to your part of the world, but I hear it's amazingly beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. He has... Um, a fellowship and master's degree in nutrition and environmental medicine and five years experience working in intensive care medicine. He runs a busy integrative medicine practice, Lotus Holistic Medicine, which you can find online. And is your website, go ahead and give us your website if people want to find yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's lotusholisticmedicine.com.au. Perfect. Um, so I, I, if you want to read more, his bio is there. I won't um, spend any more time, but uh, we have become friends even across the world because of our common interest and our common friends and our common societies in this area. And it's a worldwide problem. Um, and I'd love to start, Dr. Gupta, as far as your story, just a little background. And we all have, kind of have a story. I always joke that, you know, I didn't um, choose mold, it shows me. <laughs> so tell us about how you got into this um, area of medicine. Yeah, I think that's pretty right, Dr. Jill. I, I actually was, was working as an intensive care physician uh, here in Australia, in Brisbane, um, for around about five years. I was mainly dealing with post-cardiac surgery cases mm -hmm. and, and, and those kind of things, but also, you know, some acute cases of sepsis, but it was in, in a private hospital. And really, I was, although I had always been interested in holistic medicine when I was a medical student, when I was going through my residency, it had really been evident to me so strongly that I had to become a specialist and I had to become, you know, I had to really go into one area of medicine that was you know, particularly advanced, if you like. And, and intensive care was, was always thought to be one of the most advanced areas. And so I naturally found myself into that area. And I guess you could say that is probably one area in which modern medicine really shines because those acute cases where someone is going down the tube really quickly, um, the, the technology and so on that's available in conventional medicine can really fix them up very quickly. And, and so I do think that that, that that type of medicine is very strong. However, I then had a, a, a health crisis of my own when I was in America and basically got a gut flu when I was traveling in Oregon in 2005. And uh, I actually treated myself with ciprofloxacin which was based on the sensitivity that the yes. bug had, you know, which is the usual thing. You just pick the an antibiotic based on what a bug is susceptible to. But I had no idea that actually that could wipe out a lot of my gut flora and leave me really, really debilitated. So uh, I flew home just literally the day after I took this antibiotic. It was just a single dose. And, uh, and I came home to, to have debilitating headaches and virtually no energy. I was just really, I was all of a sudden like a chronic fatigue syndrome patient. And I had no idea what had happened. I went and saw one of the neurologists at the hospital where I was working and Really, I guess I was struck by the fact that he didn't seem to, to really take into account anything that had happened. And really, what he su suggested was prednisone, oh, high dose prednisone, like <laughs> 75 milligrams daily. And uh, he diagnosed me with cluster headache. And, you know, I, I was totally, you know, I, of course, prednisone has, has its place and can be used in certain instances. But in that particular circumstance, I felt that, hang on. This is, there's got to be another way here. There's, you know, this is definitely related to the antibiotic. And there's definitely some imbalance that this has created that I need to rectify. And so that led me just on a journey of starting to research and understand the microbiome. I didn't know what the microbiome was at that point. 
I didn't know what probiotics were. I'd never heard it. You know, I thought candida was just something that very, very rarely will affect someone um, who was immunosuppressed or something like that. So it started me thinking in a totally different way and getting an idea of, of balance in the microbiome. And luckily, I was able to fix myself up quite quickly using probiotics and getting off gluten and dairy. Uh, I was eating quite a high carbohydrate diet at the time yeah. and, uh, and, and really just bringing, you know, just some very simple solutions on that level. Glutamine was another thing that was very helpful. So I had a, a majorly leaky gut going on. So that really opened my eyes to the idea that there was a whole deeper concept of balance in the human body that could be, you know, could be understood. And it started, it started me to go even deeper. So I started doing that fellowship in nutritional environmental medicine that you mentioned. It took me about three years and it led me to just start thinking in every patient I saw, what could be the possible nutritional and environmental factors that could be involved. So rather than having a rheumatoid arthritis patient and simply reaching for the prescription pad, uh, it was more like, okay, let me start thinking. So if my illness could have been caused by antibiotics and other and high carbohydrate diet and other things, what could, what could be some of the factors that could have led this patient to have developed this illness that may have not been brought out into the spotlight? And to start with, it was kind of like, you know, I lacked confidence. But then as I started looking and things started getting uncovered, I realized, hang on, this, I actually can do this. You know, this is actually a real, and it's really beneficial way of approaching medicine and approaching health. And just because some, you know, this person may have seen esteemed doctors before now, that doesn't mean that I can't bring anything to the table just by asking the right questions. Uh, and one of the textbooks I had actually going through medical school had the, I had a really strong statement on it, which said, more is missed by not looking than not knowing. Oh, and uh, isn't that, so, isn't that such a cool so saying? True. It's so true because we don't have to know all the answers. We have to know where to find the answers or know that we heard something about that somewhere that we can go digging deeper, right? Because we don't know you and I, we've been doing this a long time. We're kind of experts in this field, but I still don't have all the answers, but I always know that there's people that I can talk to or ask or research that I can look at and help me to discover. Um, wouldn't you say, I feel like a lot of times we're on the cutting edge of some of the discoveries, even with mold related illness and ICI and some of the groups and doctors like you and I that are doing this work, um, we're constantly discovering new ways and better ways to treat it. Absolutely. It's, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a process of discovery. It's a process of inquiry that we do with the patient together. And in a sense, there's a humility there because we don't know what the answer is for any individual person. But what I'm, what I'm committed to doing, and I'm sure you are too, is just at least asking the questions, asking the deeper questions. Could there be nutritional and environmental causes behind people's illness? Uh, so, so then I actually moved on and, and totally changed my career from intens intensive care wow. to integrative general practice. So I did kind of two fellowship programs at the same time. And uh, I then moved up to the Sunshine Coast uh, here to just do what was called a rural term. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden fell in love with the place. So I was supposed to come for one year. And wow. here I am 11 years later. But um, in 2012, which was just two years after I moved here, uh, we, I had a house flood uh, really badly. There was really bad floods at that time. And uh, my partner at the time was basically bed bound. And, you know, she, she was, had to stop what she was doing at the time. She wasn't able to work. And I didn't understand what was going on. I had no idea. But I, you know, I could easily and clearly link it to the flooding event because the timing was exactly then. So uh, I really started asking myself, how could the mold that had developed from this have affected her, her human body? And around about the same time, a patient came in and started telling me about Richie Shoemaker. Uh. And started saying, was this, she said that she had watched a podcast with Dr. Richie Shoemaker and she had heard about something called the VCS test and cholestyramine and so on being used. And I, I looked at her blankly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? And uh, she said I should look into it a little bit further. And so I did. And I went on to his website and found out that he had a physician training. And so I contacted, I signed up for that straight away. No questions asked. 
and contacted his office. It took, I think it took something like six months to actually make a connection. And then at 1 a.m. in the morning, one, one fine night, I, uh, I had a Skype with Dr. Shoemaker. And he started talking to me and, and, and asking me questions about what my interest was. And he, he pretty much said, I'm going to make sure you get certified. And wow. um, he said, let's get started on this. Let, you know, he, was, he said within one to two months, he wanted me certified. So wow. it was like, what? No, the fast track. <laughs> it was a fast track. So he sent me, sent me the WHO guidelines uh -huh. and the GAO guidelines yep. on, on water and dampness. And I was like, oh my God, this is a totally new language. Yeah. I started with it. Was just, I, just, I was just determined because it was someone, you know, someone close to me was suffering. I was determined to learn it. And so he started firing off C4A and MMP9 and TGF beta. Yes. And I was like, it's one in the morning, man. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> what in the world? Well, it's funny because I love that you framed it in the beginning with, I mean, we both went to allopathic medical school, different continents, but the same kind of training. And I love that you started with intensive care, trauma medicine. These kinds of things are the best in the world, what we trained in. Because if you have a car accident or you have a heart attack or you have a stroke, you're going to want the best that we have to offer with that kind of medicine to save your life. However, we're not so good at chronic illness, inflammation, lipopolysaccharides in the gut, which is part of your story, um, no. which is that endotoxemic effect of a gut bacteria causing inflammation in the body and the leaky gut, the permeability of the gut, which years ago, doctors, our colleagues would have looked at us with you know crazy eyes. What are you talking about? And now it is well, well documented, the hyperpermeability and the link with lipopolysaccharide. And this, this is linked to cardiovascular disease, obesity, a heart, you know, um, diabetes insomnia, mood disorders, all kinds of things that we see. But all that to say, things like autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, mold-related illness are not well, um, there's not one med for these illnesses. And they actually often get worse if you just would apply that model of a med or a surgery. So we really need to think outside the box for these things. And I love that your story also emphasized, usually we're up against, I always say it's usually ourselves, a close friend or family member, or someone that we really care about that gets sick and we don't have the answers. And so we're struck with, okay, how do we find a cure or find a, a help for this person that we care about? that got sick. So that's very, very similar to most of our journeys. Um, now, I'm really curious because of that uh, intensive background. I mean, that's a phenomenal background and mold related illness has a lot of dynamics in the body, whether it's, uh, you know, tachycardia or um, POTS or those things. Do you feel like your training in the hemodynamics and some of the stuff you did in the ICU, at least that's what we call in the U U.S. The intensive oh, yeah. care, um, yeah, we call it that here too. Yeah, same thing. Uh, that yeah. they apply to some of the knowledge of the dynamics of the body in a mold-related illness. Are there little pieces that cross yes. over? Yes, definitely. And then the main crossover areas is what we call sepsis. Mm -hmm. And so, in the in the in the area of sepsis, so so, so a classic thing is is someone gets a urinary tract infection or has an episode of pneumonia, which is you know seemingly pretty mild, and then all of a sudden they get really sick. And, um, and, and all of a sudden, they're just whole bodies breaking down and people around them are going, what happened? You know, and they're, it's like, oh, my mother's in ICU now. And yeah. it's like, you know, she just had a, a little urinary tract infection. So what happened there was that infection then led to a whole cascade of inflammation, a whole cascade of cytokines. And even once the infection has been treated, that inflammatory uh, pathway may not have gone away. So that needs, that basically needed treatment in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And so often what would happen is the patient's blood vessels would get very leaky. And so they needed to go on to uh, norepinephrine or, or adrenaline or, or some of these other inotropic medications very quickly. Sometimes they needed like 10 liters or more of IV fluids in a single day just to, because all of their fluid from their blood vessels starts going into the wrong places yes. because their vessels are leaky. They then get leaky, you know, leaky lungs. And, uh, you know, this is also a topical thing because it's what happens in COVID-19 patients as yes. well who so become very ill. They get something called ARDS where basically fluid fills up their lungs and all of a sudden they may need to go onto a ventilator. And often they do get steroids as part of their treatment. Uh, interesting, intravenous vitamin C is also a really important thing, although that hasn't been adopted widely, I don't think, in ICUs. But that's a, another really important part of the treatment is, is intravenous vitamin C along with steroids and along with vitamin B1 or thiamine 
are some of the really key yes. things which have been shown by Professor Murray uh, to be very helpful. I mean, he's now trying to trying to demonstrate it in large large uh, trials and so on. But most likely, that's going to turn out to be one of the most helpful things because all of these substances help with inflammation. And so I do think modern, modern medicine is very good at dealing with sepsis. But what I noticed is once patients were out of the ICU, they would still often have symptoms. They would have low-grade symptoms. Often they'd say, oh, you know, I've got really achy joints or I'm really fatigued and, you know, I'm just, my brain's just not working like it was before. And really in commercial medicine, we didn't really have any answers for that part. And, you know, that's probably where they needed a little bit of gut repair and mm -hmm. where the, you know, where they needed to, to look at any, any lingering damage that had been done there. And they needed to look at other triggers of inflammation. You talked about bacterial, you know, LPS and so on. That's probably likely to be the case because we know sepsis patients do develop leaky gut problems. So there was a whole other world there that was, that could also have been addressed if we knew about the science of integrative medicine. So I, it's really my utmost hope that at some point um, this comes into hospital medicine so we can be even more excellent in our, Gosh, in our medical it's care. Just, it really is a great framework because we talk about in mold related illnesses, this environmental trigger. And in a minute, we'll talk about water damage buildings. If you're listening, well, how might you know what are some symptoms? But just to frame it, um, what Dr. Gupta is talking about is we have these environmental triggers. I always say it's like toxic soup in a water damaged building. And granted, there's mold and the mycotoxins that that mold produces. And those are very, very small. They're ionophores, which means they go right inside your cells. Usually we get them through inhalation. You can ingest them as well, but inhalation is a primary route in a water damaged building. And then these go diffuse right into your bloodstream and they are um, trichosethenes and okra toxins and aflatoxins and some of the list of the damage they cause. Um, trichosethenes have been studied for um, chemical warfare agents and they're kidney toxic, which is nephrotoxic and they're toxic to the brain and the nervous system and they're toxic to all parts of the body. And like you said, they trigger these cascade of events called cytokines and inflammatory molecules. And then those guys go on and create the damage. I always like to frame it in like the flu or the COVID. The virus itself isn't what causes the damage in the sense of that the, the virus is the trigger to trigger your own immune system to have this fight or flight reaction to throw out all the armed guards to try to fight its way out of that situation. But that your own immune system's response is what actually causes most of the damage. And that's the same way with mold. And that's exactly what Dr. Gupta was saying in the ICU. These Patients, they get inflammation from bacteria. And again, in water damage building, there is bacteria, there's yeast, there's other fungi, there's all kinds of things, and these contribute to the milieu. So let's talk about if patients are, you know, all of a sudden with the pandemic, they're stuck at home and they're having more symptoms. Let's first talk about symptoms. What are the common, most common things that you see with mold related illness? And then we'll go on to what do you do about it in your house or your office? Yeah, absolutely. And, and often the symptoms are, are pretty subtle or insidious to start with in most cases. Mm -hmm. And they can be anything from fatigue to insomnia to just feeling a bit more flat, like a little bit more depressed than normal, uh, to getting joint pains or muscle pains. Or it can also be abdominal symptoms, such as bloating or constipation. And in some cases, it's, it's more local symptoms in the sinuses or the lungs. Where, where people could be getting nasal congestion or shortness of breath. Um, there are some more specific symptoms, like if you're getting more of a vibratory sensation in the body mm -hmm. or uh, a sense of like a static electricity shocks that are happening a lot of the time, that's pretty, that's pretty specific for mold-related illness. The other thing that people often get is they start feeling like they're thirsty all the time and need to urinate all the time. So sometimes it can be mistaken for diabetes. Um, because you get, you get abnormalities in, in certain hormones called ADH or antidiuretic hormone, which can cause a similar kind of pattern to diabetes. Yeah, this is real common. You know, uh, after exposure, patients will increase thirst and urination. And it's similar in the sense of the patients with hemodynamic instability, that regulation system that we have is off balance. And so instead of conserving water when you drink and maintaining hydrated in your vascular system, two things happen. That regulation called ADH, which you mentioned, is kind of broken. So you drink and you pee and you drink and you pee and you're actually dehydrated no matter how much water you drink because your body can't maintain the volume it needs to function. And that can also lead to things like postural orthostatic tachycardia, which is also called POTS, where you have a very low blood pressure if you stand up quickly and your heart starts to beat very fast. 
people can feel really dizzy or lightheaded when they're standing up and not be able to, they maybe have to lay, lie down to feel well, or um, they can't maintain sitting or standing for long periods of time. Um, there's something else that can happen in here, and that's the mast cells can get angry yes. and activated. Tell us a little bit about mast cells and why that's important to think about with mold-related illness. Yeah, so that's something I've really only started looking at over the last two to three years. And, and you'll recall we did a webinar about it maybe yeah. two, three years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of the things I saw is some of, the, some of the patients who we treated for mold and CIRS would just react to everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and often they had a subtype of mold related illness where they were getting a lot of flushing and burning and skin rashes and so on. And they tended just to be very, very sensitive. Often they were reacting to food that they were eating. And, uh, and sometimes they could react to things as innocuous as, as water. And so there was a subset there that I started to recognize where the, the chronic inflammation appeared largely to be related to mast cells. And often these patients would respond to being on a lower histamine diet and then getting on specific supplements or medications specifically aimed at the mast cells. And so that could be simple supplements like quercetin or, um, or, or medications such as chromalin and ketodafin or even antihistamines, the H1 and H2 blockers. Uh, and, and, you know, often there, there was a bit of a, there's a trial and error process that often needs to happen in order for them to find the right treatment for them to be able to switch off that mast cell response for long enough for them to then directly then go and address the mold. But I, I am seeing that's a very, very important component for many people's illness with mold. Yeah, oh gosh, I would totally agree with you. It's, it's been one of the biggest things that's um, been the rate limiting factor, the thing that stops people from getting well. If, if we as physicians don't address it, we can't really do the treatment protocols because often, for example, say someone's had a mold related illness, they have pretty significant mast cell activation. You try to give them glutathione and binders and these things. And what you're doing is you're mobilizing the toxins. And this is good because you need to excrete them. But as you mobilize, they can kind of get that re-exposure and it makes the mast cells incredibly angry. Um, just for fun, I'll share it with you guys for just one second, a screen share. I just saw an article of Dr. Theorides that shows this beautifully in a diagram. So I'm just gonna share it for a moment. This is um, proposed diagnostic criteria. And you can see their common symptoms, brain fog, diarrhea, flushing, headaches, hives, low blood pressure, itching, muscle pain, palpitations, and shortness of breath. And brain fog is in like 95% of the patients. So this is really, really common to have um, you know, a lot of those symptoms. So what about the building? What do we do? That's for us here, at least in the US, there's not a lot of great certified um, IEPs, which is indoor air quality specialists that really, really understand this illness. And so there's a whole subset of remediators that can take away the mold, but if they're not really careful in how they do that and how they maintain that environment and how they clean up the environment after our patients, um, they tend to be sick or get sick or not do well. So I'd love to hear your experience with that and um, what you advise our patients to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of my experience in this area comes from doing you know, making the, the common mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, so it's very easy to make mistakes in this whole area. And that's one reason that having a really good source of information regarding mold illness is, is, is just, you know, can't be emphasized enough. So one of the key things is you need to get a, a mold inspector or what we call an IEP who is familiar with CIRS and mast cell activation and basically chronic illness due to mold. The reason for that is they then understand the idea that even small levels of mold and, um, and other types of microbial contamination, such as bacterial contamination, can keep the inflammatory pathways activated in someone with these illnesses. And so if, if someone doesn't understand this and they really are only understanding mold at a superficial level, then they're not going to be able to firstly look for mold at a deep enough, in a deep enough way uh, and, and to a thorough enough degree. And secondly, their recommendations are generally not going to be thorough enough to be able to eradicate mold at a, at a, a comprehensive enough level for you to be able to recover. So that's one of the, the first key points is knowing that all IEPs are not the same. Uh, all mold inspectors are not the same. And that if you take the time to choose a suitably qualified IEP 
then that time is is definitely worth the investment. Yeah, I completely agree. And I don't know about you, I'd love to hear your opinion, but for people when, you know, they come in my office, sometimes it's the believability of, if you just ask a patient, you know, do you have mold in your home? 99% of them will say, well, no, there's no mold in my yes. house. Yes. So you have to be a little sneaky about the questions. <laughs> and it's not really yes. sneaky. I just joke that way because you have to be very, very good detective and say, is there condensation on your windows? Have you ever had a leak in your attic or your sump pump in your basement? Has there ever been moisture on the walls of your basement? There's just so many questions that you can rattle off. Um, washer dryer leaks, um, leaks under your uh, faucet in your sinks. Um, what about your shower, shower? Is the tiles, are they leaky are they porous there's porous tiles some of these most beautiful italian tiles are quite porous and if they don't have the barrier behind them it goes right through if your if your contractor didn't build the house right i've seen many 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 beautiful million dollar homes with master baths that are full of mold so just because you have a very nice home or a new home does not um, eliminate the risk mm -hmm. but what i like to do is often either those plates or ermi test they are not perfect but it is one tool that we can use to get started for relatively inexpensive. And sometimes I find like, say a patient does an ERMI test and I see 30 of ketomium, gosh, I'm worried that that's an issue. And I can then say, get an inspector to find out where that's at. I'd love to hear, um, is that similar to your um, approach to those kinds of things in the beginning? Yes, definitely. It, it all depends on, on where the person is at and where the patient is at. And also funds often plays into this in a big way, of course. Yes, yes. And as you said, you know, to start with just even broaching the, the conversation is sometimes a little difficult because the way we've been taught in our culture to think about mold is mainly at a cleanliness level. Yeah. Sometimes people can almost take it that you're questioning their cleanliness. Right. You start, you start bringing up mold. And so need to sometimes take a different approach, as you say, and start asking more tangential questions around whether people felt unwell in, in certain homes. And then in the history, if we establish that there appears to have been, uh, you know, a history of, of water damaged buildings and, and there's been a correlation with symptoms, often when people, you know, come in with diagnoses such as chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and so on, this part of the history had never really been teased out. And sometimes they when, especially if you have enough time for a consultation, and that's, you know, as a functional medicine doctor, we often take a lot of time for our consultations. Because some of these little points take a little while to tease out. And, and, and the person may have never thought of it before. That actually, you know what? That house I was living in, that's where I started to get unwell. And yeah, it did have leaks. How many times have you heard that? Yes, all the time. It's like the thought yeah. had during the interview, you're like, well, so yeah. in 2018, you moved and every since then you have not felt well. And your daughter and your son both have chronic sinus issues since then. And your husband... Yeah brain fog so yeah, yeah it's, it's like the light bulb goes on when this line of questioning is pursued and it's like hang on huh? now that i think about it yes i yeah. was unwell in that that's when i got unwell and the, yeah there was a leak there and there was some musty smells and so on and it's like okay so this new place have you then moved the furniture with you and everything with you yeah. oh yeah we just took everything with us right, right? so you can understand right. then that's why we've got ongoing uh, activation of the inflammatory pathways so often in those cases, uh, you know, having just doing a, a ERMI test or a plate test could be a reasonable place to start. And then in some cases, just doing some simple do-it-yourself remediation work can be a, a reasonable place to start. So for instance, if you have any porous goods that have come from a contaminated house, yeah. then you need to either wash them if they're clothes or scan them and dispose of them if they're papers. Um, or just, you know, or just dispose of them if they're things like fluffy toys and lounge suites and mattresses. Unfortunately, at this point, although we're, you know, our movement, we're exploring ways that we may be able to, to salvage some of these items. At this point, we don't have any reliable means for porous goods and you've just, you've just got to dispense of those. And then the, the not porous goods, which are generally metal and glass and hard finished wood and so on, you can generally clean those using a damp wipe and using a HEPA vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, just after doing all of, all of those things, you can then go ahead and repeat the ERMI or the plate test and see, are you starting to get to the realms of, of you know, of, of being a reasonably clean house or is there still some contamination there, which may lead us to have to go and get an IEP for this new house in yeah. any case, because most homes, unfortunately, have some form of water damage, structural water damage to them. 
that's the bad news here. So in many cases, there, there is still going to be some, some underlying issues that need to be addressed. And, and getting an IEP who's really familiar with chronic illness due to mold will be really beneficial because they know how to look deeply. You know, they're not going to just come in and, and tap a few walls and spray right. a bit of essential oil, right? right. They're right. going to actually come and really do a comprehensive examination. They need to be doing moisture readings and moisture mapping of the house. They Ideally, fire infrared cameras can be very helpful. And then they will do, you know, they'll take a very hurry, uh, thorough history just as we do, you know, when we're assessing patients. The similar thing applies to an assessment of a home. They need to have a history of where any leaks may have occurred and to look at those areas with much more, um, with, you know, with a much more thorough eye, if you like. And then often sampling is the last part of their, of their assessment where they may do air and or surface and or ERMI testing to then further elucidate what problems are in the house. Yeah, they've got what a great overview. And there are now virtual, I know we both belong to the ICI group and that's a great resource. So it's International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness dot um, org. So I S E A I dot O R G. And there are IEPs like Michael Schrantz and Larry Schwartz and uh, yes. Greg Weatherman um, that do virtual. So they can, you know, look in and, and sometimes they're just advising you to a poo to have on the ground. They call it boots on the ground kind of people that might come in. And again, this can get expensive. So you can start with small things. I love that Dr. Gupta said, so there's a couple scenarios. One would be like you have mold, black stacky boxes behind that wall. Most mold is not visible. So just because you can't see anything does not mean it's not there. And the big thing before you do a lot of cleaning, you wanna make sure that there's not some massive mold hiding somewhere because that no amount of cleaning will take care of that issue. However, if it's just been an old house, you brought belongings from an old moldy house and there's not any massive hidden sources behind a wall, what Dr. Gupta is saying is that you could possibly get rid of porous items, clean the ones that you can, um, and then do, uh, usually I have patients do some sort of a fogging and then a fine particulate clean or a small particulate clean and then cleaning the duct. So you're getting a really, really thorough clean because the dust in the particulate from dead mold that's left behind can still trigger the immune system. So this is the frustrating thing is just because you get rid of the wet bulk stacky batteries doesn't mean what's left behind that contaminated the air can't still make you sick. And this is why we, we have to deal with the patients who are in this environment and often very triggered by it and even by the remediation. So that's remediation. Let's dive into just a little bit, little bits of treatment. Now I wanna say we're here to, to talk about your course and in the, in the last 10 minutes or so, I wanna be sure and give you time to do that. So as you're listening, one of the reasons I brought Dr. Gupta on is I believe in his work, um, his labor of love with the uh, mold illness, uh, mold illness made simple too, right? Yeah, yeah right. we will. I already put a link here. I'll make sure you guys all have that link. But he has done, I don't know how many years you've spent. You put a lot of effort into this course, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the original version was released four years ago. So we probably started working on this myself and Caleb right around six years ago. Mm -hmm. And this probably ties into the discussion we've been having is that often when people find out, that for instance, their home may be contaminated or maybe it's a workplace, uh, there's a massive amount of overwhelm. Yeah. And there's a lot of anxiety and it's, you know, people can get stuck because it feels like it's just impossible to, to move forward. You know, it feels like that the expenses are just never ending uh, and to be able to then make the decision to remediate your house or to move, that's a really, really big one. And to be able to find a proper doctor or, or practitioner to be able to treat you. All of these little decisions just seem very overwhelming, especially when you yourself are not feeling well. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, and, and oftentimes people's brains are just not really able to make decisions as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the info that's out there in this area, although there are some simpler things coming in now, uh, but originally a lot of the info that was out there in this area of mold illness was extremely complicated in my view. And it was, you know, it's great, it's great info, but it's not necessarily the info that someone with a really foggy mind is going to be able to understand. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we went through our physician training and so on, uh, you know, we were able to get through all of that. But, you know, if there had been an easier path for me, I would have much preferred to have taken that. You know? Like you said, and 1 so, a.m. with TGF beta and MMP9. and I <laughs> Yeah, that was not the easiest path, the one that I took there. You know, that was just like getting into all of these hundred page documents yeah. 
and then slowly trying to find a gem in there where it would then, you know, on page 99, it would probably explain the question right. I was looking right. for or something <laughs> like that. It's like, why not just go straight to the information that's needed? Yeah. So Mold Almost Made Simple is really just an attempt to do that. It's just an attempt to go straight to this is what you need to know and nothing else kind of thing. So, you know, we, we first start talking about what is inflammation, just yeah. that really simple concept. And we describe it as a silent fire in your body. So just like the ICU patient who had sepsis yeah. and starting to get a few joint pains and some fatigue when they're back in the ward, they're still, although the fire has been put out to a large extent, they've still got the embers of inflammation going on there. And that's why they're sick. They've still got inflammation. And, and so it's the same thing with people who have had a massive exposure to mold. There is a silent fire of inflammation going on in their body. And this relates to something called cytokines. Mm -hmm. Cytokines are proteins that the immune system creates. They're like bullets, if you like, that, that the immune system is creating to try and eliminate foreign agents. But they're just not, they're not very effective in a sense. And, and really what we need is a proper acquired immune response to take place. But that generally doesn't take place with people who have a certain genetic predisposition uh, to mold-related illness. So instead, they get this chronic inflammatory response. And that can lead to symptoms of almost all systems of the body. And as I say, that's what we explain in a lot of depth in part one of the course. And then we go on to talk about buildings, because if you don't get your building right and you don't deal with that side, there's no use going and having treatment, would you say, um, Dr. Jill? That's what we found. Absolutely, really, right. This doesn't work as well. And uh, so, so that's, that's a real key. And as I said, we started to allude to some of the, the, um, the basic considerations when you're looking at dealing with your building. So first thing was make sure that you find an IEP who, who's really, um, really co properly qualified. So there are also certain certifications that we go over but they understand chronic illness due to mold. And then the second thing is finding a remediator. If you decide to do remediation, is finding a remediator who properly understands CRS and has proper methods for remediating a building um, that, you know, that basically stand up to scrutiny. And so we also talk about questions that you can ask a mold inspector and questions that you can ask a mold remediator to make sure that you're getting the proper help. And I personally believe that if even just for that little piece, the course is worth it because if you, you know, if you make mistakes in that whole area and for instance, you just get, you know, get someone around the corner from you who's, who's a general, who's a, just a general mold inspector, but they've never dealt with chronic illness patients, most likely you're going to have to end up going and duplicating all the work you've done before. You're going to have to go and get another inspection. You're going to go and have other remediation done. And so you best to just get it right the first time. And that's why it's so important to have the right information. Yeah, how many times have you heard patients come in, uh, had one, two, three, four inspections, and they're all normal, I don't have mold, and then you find out there's a huge issue, or even worse, oh, we had a remediation and I'm still sick, or we had two things, you know, major remediations and I'm still not improved. That's sadly not the exception to the rule. Yeah, that's right. It's so common that people have had problems in this domain. And, and this can drag on for years and years and years. And what, you know, during this time, you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to have a clean building and to have got better. So basically, having really good information about proper qualifications of, of a mold inspector and remediator are really important. And also just understanding what not to do. So one of the big things is when you, if you decide to move from a contaminated, contaminated home, then you've got to treat your possessions. You can't take the contaminated possessions with you. As, as we said before, you know, we've got to, you've got to look at those porous possessions, even though they, they may be very, you know, very sentimental to you. You've got to deal with them in some way, even if that way is putting them in a plastic box and sealing the plastic box and taping it up for a later time. Um, that's still way better than just having them out in the air to then contaminate the new house. But there's a whole bunch of considerations when it comes to buildings. And, and then we also then get into the treatment, which I think we were gonna, we're gonna jump into a little bit now. Um, so th there's a whole bunch of different steps that are really important with treatment, but probably the most important one is binders. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say? 
And, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so binders, you know, they, they can be pharmaceutical or they can be natural. And so in this version of the course, we really expand this whole area of binders and talk about all of the natural binders. We do talk about cholestyramine and well coal and how they can be used, but we also talk about bentonite clay and zeolite and, and also the combinations that are out there, like toxins bind and, mm -hmm. and ultra binder and so on, and how you can use uh, urinary mycotoxin testing in some cases to decide on the precise binders and detoxification supplements that, that you may care to use, or you know whether you just decide to use a more generic kind of protocol um, which these days we generally recommend that even if you're using cholestyramine and Welcol, that you at least use one natural binder in there as well, so that you're getting a more comprehensive scope. It's not just picking up, you know, ochratoxin. So we go into that in a lot of depth. And then we talk about some of the other, the other steps of the original Shoemaker protocol. Probably the most important one is VIP, nasal spray. Yeah, and which for some people is still very, very useful. Uh, it doesn't help everyone, but for some people, that's just a, you know, it tends to, it's just a real key for them. It's almost like it, it's a key just fits their door and all of a sudden, you know, they're just, the inflammation just going down majorly. And in other cases, it really, you know, it doesn't have a major symptomatic effect. And I guess that just shows how unique different. everyone is, how, how different everyone is. And then the other things we cover now is, is also fungal colonization. And that's a new piece that I've added in oh, this that's course. Wonderful, wonderful. If yeah, you'd like so to share, uh, you're welcome to share some of the slides on your course too. I bet. Yeah, know. sure. Let me do that. So I'll just go ahead here and. Perfect. There we go. Okay, so really, I've covered a lot of this. We talk a, a lot about how, uh, how water damage can happen to a building, but there's so many different ways. You know, it can be microbial growth in a bathroom. It can be uh, due to waterproofing or so many other different problems. And so, as we said before, you can decide to do a do-it-yourself test or have a proper professional inspection done, which if it then indicates water damage or mold growth uh, and you've got a multi-system, multi-symptom illness, then all the signs are there that you may well have CIRS or mast cell activation syndrome. And so there's a number of tests you can do, and we do cover all of those in this course. And it's, it's a much more broad view of the testing in this course. So we talk about the urinary and nasal mycotoxin testing and, um, and also the fungal stool testing, uh, which is, is still available with various labs such as uh, GI map. And we also talk about how you can do nasal fungal and bacterial cultures with microbiology DX. And then we do still cover the inflammatory and hormonal markers that can be done with Quest and LabCorp. So you know, if you've got an insurance plan that covers these, uh, these uh, tests, then in many cases, that's a great idea. You could still have these tests done. And I think now, Dr. Jill, you're doing them pretty much all with LabCorp, is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And, uh, and then, but they can point to certain abnormalities, and particularly in a legal case, I've found that those tests tend to be very helpful. Uh, and then the organic acid test, that's a test that I'm using more and more. When we talk about what some of the markers are on there that tend to indicate that you're colonized or affected with mold. And then we also talk about neuroquant. Uh, which, is, which is a very useful test in, if it's available in your area. And we also talk about gene. Uh, so there's a whole host of tests that can be done. However, it just depends on, on your particular case and on your particular budget. I do also make the point that, you know, in some cases you can just get treated with minimal testing. You don't necessarily have to do extensive testing if you basically know, if you're convinced and you understand the fact that mold is affecting your health and you want to just basically treat your building and then go through a treatment protocol. In many cases, you can actually do that without a whole lot of testing. But on the other hand, and particularly in legal cases or in cases where you want more information, there was a whole host of tests available. And so just, just tracking back a little bit, we've already, I think we've already kind of alluded to the fact that getting away from the water damage building exposure is the single most important step in getting better. And if you do that, you're halfway there. Uh, in terms of in terms of recovery, generally speaking, the second thing, well, what I haven't mentioned here is is if you have mast cell activation, it's probably best to address that first. Would you say, Dr. Jill? Yes, absolutely. 
yeah. So so we could add an extra step in here. So if the mast cell activation is present, go ahead and treat that first with a low histamine diet and supplements or pharmaceutical agents for that. And then thirdly, then get onto binders such as cholestyramine, glucol, charcoal, clay, zeolite, chitosan, etc. And as I say, that can be generic or that can be according to your testing. And then the, the next thing is to consider whether you've got fungal colonization and or Marquardt's colonization. And really, we were thinking of this in a more broad sense now, really just thinking about the nasal biome and yeah. not so much fixated on the idea of Marcons being the, the sole problem. And so we talk about some of the different agents that can be used, such as colloidal silver and or EDTA, antifungal meds such as nystatin or, or amphotericin, nasal sprays. And then we also talk about how to treat GI colonization with fungus using antifungal meds or herbs. And then lastly, we talk about inflammation correction, and particularly the, the area of neuroinflammation. inflammation and there's a whole host of things that can be used for this, including fish oil, the low amylose, or an, various versions of an anti-inflammatory diet, resveratrol, curcumin, the limbic and vagus support. This is a really important area I'm going to touch on quickly, and this is uh, one of the longest lessons, actually, in the new version of the course. I, I think it's about one hour and 20 minutes. We cover all of the systems of limbic system retraining and, and also methodologies for vagus system support. And this has kind of become more and more, this has come to my awareness more and more that this whole element of the, the limbic system needs to be addressed in, in cases of mold, or, or at least in many cases it needs to be addressed. And if you are able to add some limbic system retraining into your whole process, that actually reduces a lot of the inflammation on the neurological level, which will help your healing in a very great way. And so it doesn't mean that, that we're saying the illness is just in your head. Right. Uh, <laughs> it means, well, in one sense, it, it is. In one sense, there's, a, there's an actual physical inflammation component yeah. in your limbic system of the brain. So it's very physical. And that's something that you can address with a, a you know a very structured progress process rather for limbic system retraining. So there's DNRS. There's the and Gupta I would go as far as to say that um, everybody with mold related illness needs to look at this because it's a trauma, and whether we like it or not, that mold exposure. Even if we're like, oh, I'm going to be fine, I know I'll get well. Like even if you have a great positive attitude and you're well adapted and you've done therapy, even so, this type of an illness is so different in that it actually attacks your limbic. Some people call it limbic loop, and it's this limbic yeah. loop of fight or flight. So your subconscious, when you get exposed, is actually re-triggered every time, and so you have to do something. To kind of calm the system down and say, "Hey, it's going to be okay," and this is through that limbic stuff you're going to do, you describe in the course. Yeah, so that I, I think again, just for that chapter alone, I think the course is worth it just to really understand why limbic system retraining is recommended in almost all patients with this illness, and to also just look at the different options. You know, so there's GNRS, there's the Gupta program, there's ANRS reset. There's a whole bunch of them. And so we help you look at the different options. We also look at somatic psychotherapy modalities for people who really want to go deep, dive deep and look at releasing some of the trauma that they've had from the past. So there's a lot of info in there. And then we also talk about various other supplements you can use. We've talked about VIP. Uh, Synapsin is another type of nasal spray that's often used, which uses a, a compound called uh, nicotinamide riboside. As, as well as ginseng, compounds from ginseng, which is a really, really ancient herb that's been used for a, a variety of things. And then we talk about vitamin D, lithium, lion's mane, all sorts of different uh, supplements that can be used to support the, the you know, rebuilding of your neurological system, because often there is some degree of damage that occurs to your neurological system. So there's a lot of information about this as well. So jumping right into it, uh, if that's okay, Dr. Jill. So yeah. the the, uh, yeah, the course basically now is 17 hours. So it's increased from about eight hours. And the basically they're animated lectures with the, with slides on the screen with my beautiful Australian accent. And um, there's nine modules now and basically 30 lessons. So it's not it's not run at, at any particular time. It's basically 
can be completed totally at your own pace, which I think is important for uh, CRS and, and chronic fatigue patients because sometimes you have to pace yourself in terms of energy. And mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, you can then, this way you can choose when you when you have a day where you're actually feeling better and you have good energy levels and you're you're able to take in information. Because I know sometimes you have days where you're just not able to take anything at all. So it's totally it's totally done at your own pace. However, it's good to make a schedule of, you know, of what sort of time period you want to do it over. And I think it's really important that, you know, it's not for everyone. Really, this course is just for people who really want to take the time to learn this illness and, uh, and, and properly go through the information, perhaps over a few months' time. And Dr. Gupta, we had a question, right? As we're talking about, is this for practitioners or patients? I'm hearing this is definitely for the patients, but I am assuming doctors who don't know anything about it, it would be excellent for them as well. Yes. Yeah, we've had that feedback so far. We've had a lot of practitioners, including doctors, do it. And I think, as I said, you know, I would have thought of this a much better uh, pathway to learning about mold because really once you have those simple, those simple concepts down, you can easily then add the more advanced medical information afterwards. That's, all, that's not difficult in my view. But I think the, the key even for physicians is to just get the really core basic information down pat, like mm-hmm. this bit about, you know, how do you screen for CRS? How do you diagnose CRS? We cover that all in part one. And as I said, in part two, I think that the information on water damage buildings is probably the harder information to come about. Uh, and that's where we really talk about this idea of water damage building testing and the basics of remediation and what should happen during a remediation process. Personally, as a doctor, I think I've found that that has been the information that, you know, hasn't been that easy to, to lay yeah. my hands on. And uh, I really had to go digging for a lot of this information, going into things like the IICRC guidelines and so on. Right. And, yeah. And then lastly, how to just find and maintain a healthy home. Again, that's information that's not you know, readily out there and available. So this is, this is kind of, we've distilled a lot of information from a variety of different sources, including scientific papers and so on. So I think for a physician looking as a starting point, all the references are also in there. So I think for a physician, they're probably more likely to go and then look up the references and, and, and actually download some of those references so that they don't have the scientific papers on hand. And so that's basically, that's the way in which they can have a much more scientific uh, form of investigation into this illness. But I think that the same information applies. Yeah. And uh, in many cases, I also find physicians who are, who are doing this course and are interested in this course have someone they know or they have patients who, who may be suffering from this illness. And so the, the practical focus still tends to be quite helpful for them, you know, in terms of mm-hmm. just some of the simple practical tips that we, that we include. So, yes, I would definitely say that, that for a physician, if you're just starting off with this illness, I would say this is absolutely a very good way to go. Uh, and then... Lastly, in the bonus module, which you included this time, the, the lesson one, we talk about how you can actually use biomarkers such as C4A and MMP9 to determine whether you have a water damage building. And, and what I mean here is that you can actually use them as a provocation test. So we talk a lot about something called a mold sabbatical uh, in this course. And a mold sabbatical is when you get away from your building and generally go tent camping or go to a building that you know is safe for two weeks or more. And then you come back and re-expose yourself to the building that you're in again. And all of a sudden, sometimes what happens is you can notice a correlation between your symptoms and that building that you never noticed before. Yeah. Well, the other thing that you can add to this is you can actually draw blood while you're away on the mold sabbatical for C4A and anti-GF beta and MMP9 and so on, and then draw it again, maybe 24 hours after you then re-expose yourself to the house. And in some cases, you then see a big jump. And that can be very helpful to then confirm once and for all that the building is contributing to your or your patient's health. And, um, you know, I think that that kind of information can be very, very helpful, especially when you're making, having to make a decision on to whether to remediate or move. Stay or remediate or leave. Or I had a little similar. I went to Maui last year and massive mold in my hotel. And, and now I know what to do. So, I, I mean, it still made me a little ill, but I got out of it. I got through it pretty quickly. But when I got home, a week and a half later, I did my C4A and it was about 4,000. So it was clearly confirmation that I had just gotten out of the mold there in Maui. So interesting to- Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. So there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways in which you can use these biomarkers and some of the other tests. And then lesson two, we talk about the psycho-emotional stress of mold illness and, and the trauma that people experience through it and, and how limbic retraining and vagus nerve um, stimulation techniques can be extremely helpful as part of your recovery. Uh, so in lesson three, we talk more of as a special interest area. We talk about CRS and COVID-19 and the, the connections there and really put to bed this idea that, that CRS patients are at greater risk because at this point, it doesn't appear that there's anything to suggest that if your CRS is, is well managed, that you're at greater risk of this illness. But we do talk about some preventative things you can do, including vitamin D, um, et cetera. Okay. And then lastly, in lesson four, we talk about other causes of multi-system, multi-symptom illness. Because we don't, the other side of the coin here is although we're saying that mold is huge as a problem for chronic illness, you know, it's, it's, it's often the most overlooked thing and one of the most important things, we also don't want people to get so caught up in it that they overlook other important causes. Right. And so we also then talk about things like SIBO, which Dr. Jill talks a lot about in her podcasts, and also pyroluria, heavy metal toxicity, parasites. These are just some of the things we, we think about every day with functional medicine. And you know, it's, it's important that we keep these in, in the greater net of, of our illness and we don't just focus on mold alone, that we keep a broad, we keep a broad net, I think is a good way to put it. Well, this uh, is um, absolutely amazing that you, and it's, again, the, the first course was great. This is, uh, this is times 10 or times 100, <laughs> the, the quality and the amount of content you have here. I, and if you're listening live today, there's a link below that you can check out. There's a, also a code that uh, Dr. Gupta has yeah, so graciously given us to share with our listeners. So you get $100 off, which is quite a big deal um, for the course. I mean, this is just an incredible deal, Dr. Gupta. I know this is a massive amount of work and so much great information. And this is a great, great price for, for our listeners. Yeah, I, I sincerely think it's worth it. If you're, if you're suffering from this illness, I think there's, there's really no question because clear information leads to you feeling clearer. You feeling clearer leads to less overwhelm and less limbic system activation. Once you feel clear, you can get some confidence and then you can start to move forward. Uh, one of the things, as I said, one of the, the things that my heartfelt desire is the outcome of this course is that people may be able to use it to help move forward towards recovery. And, and that's, really, that's really the intention behind it, uh, is, is that you can really feel that there's a path forward for you and this is not the end and uh, realizing that not only can you recover from this illness but often there's a really big life shift that happens afterwards on, rec on um, recovering from mold illness often there's a lot of, of different personal transformation and meaning that comes of this and often people can find that the life that they're living after recovering from mold illness is way more fulfilling than the one they lived before. And, and, and I really mean this, and I have seen this in a number of cases. Yeah, I love that you say that. I, that's definitely my story. I, I'm writing right now my book, and it talks about some of the story, and that's actually a part, part called The Awakening. There's this piece that happens that really, really shifted my life in many ways, and it was started with mold-related illness. So I can relate to that on, on so many levels. Um, well, gosh, well, thank you for your time today, Dr. Gupta. This is just incredibly informative. I really encourage you, if you're listening, to check this out. I think it's a phenomenal resource. Um, and again, I know how much time and energy and effort you've put into it. Um, any last comments or things that you'd like uh, our listeners to know? Well, I think just reiterating this idea that there, there is a, you know, there is a bright new world on the other side of this illness. When you're right in the middle of this, uh, I think if someone had come up to me and said, oh, you know, you're going to find amazing meaning after some of this, I would, you know, I would kind of um, wouldn't believe them or I'd, I'd tell them, you know, that they just had no idea how severe this whole thing was. Right. But then you t start making steps towards recovery and you start walking in the right direction. All of a sudden, you know, you find that all of the things that you do start compounding. And I really also want to, to tell people if anyone's been caught up with this idea that they have the dreaded gene or that they, you know, that they, unless they find a perfect house, they'll never get to recovery. Just to let go of some of those ideas that were really floating around in the world, in the mold world uh, some time back. 
really what one of the key messages we're mentioning here is it, it is possible for everyone to recover. And even if it's difficult, even if it means living in a tent for a little while, there is a way forward. And I want you guys to take that in and really feel that, uh, that there, there is a solution here and you're going to be able to find it. One of the keys is to find some really good, clear information. So this course is here as an option for you. If you want to do it, as we say, you just need to go to the website. Dr. Jill will also post a, a specific link uh, below in the, in the Facebook page. And you just can go in and, and, and click on sign up and use the, that coupon code where it asks you, do you have a coupon code? And that, that's going to run for the next 48 hours or so. So I really want people to, to be able to access this information. So we've made it very affordable. So I really hope that, that you consider this option. And, and and hopefully benefit from it. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, getting up early in that side of the world and joining us this morning and this afternoon for us. And for us in the U.S., if you haven't got out to vote, I just want to encourage you, you still have a little bit of time um, to do that today. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. As always, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Thanks, Dr. Jill. It was great talking to you and um, look forward to doing another call some other time. You got it.